Alright. So now, um, who'd like to talk about that? <coughs> I told you to brace yourself. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes? Um, I'm a grade 6 teacher, and I see a lot of bullying. And the, the way I look at it is that how I explain it to the victim and, and to the rest of the, the onlookers, the bystanders, that the bully is suffering so much inside for whatever reason that when he bullies, it makes him feel better. Just for that little bit of time, it gives him a relief of his own suffering to see somebody else suffering. So from there, I have my school kids think of how to help the bully to release him from his suffering other than making someone else suffer. The, the bullies are victims themselves. Yeah, and often the, the victims, um, what I've been teaching them is to break the silence. Break the silence. And they often, if not helped early enough, to give them the tools to um, to counteract the bullying and to no longer become a victim, um, if they aren't helped and if they don't work it out, they themselves become bullies. And then the bystander, uh, when I talk to my students and they tell, uh, I ask them, why aren't more of you speaking up about this? I hear that they have tried in the past and then they became the target of the bully. Yep. So then it was trying to teach the victim and the bystander how else they could break the silence without necessarily being directly involved in that punch or whatever it is. Yep. There's all kinds of ways to, to destabilize this equation, right? which is ultimately what it is. Because something's happening. There's a, it's like a chemical reaction that's occurring. And it doesn't take much to just throw that off, right? To stop, to stop that catalytic process. Um, and there's uh, some materials that I was reading uh, prior to this that talked about different ways. There can be things like distraction, humor, going and just standing by the victim, or deliberately including the victim in what you're doing, or inviting, right, to just, there's all kinds of ways that you can participate without making yourself a target. But even then, one of the things that this material was talking about was that that what makes a, a target for bullying tends to be if somebody, the first, with the first instance, if you don't stand up, if you, if you don't uh, respond assertively to the aggression of the bully, then the bully knows that you're a safe target, right? So whatever way you do it, the bully's not gonna go after somebody who has a, a, a strong assertive reaction because it's not worth their effort. They are looking for easy targets, safe targets, right? So if you're going to be the stand-up, make myself a target now to, to save the victim, you want to make sure that you have the confidence not to stand up and then, oh, sorry, I'm and then you're the next. <laughs> so depending on whether you are a person of an assertive nature or a very passive nature, there's all kinds of different things that you can do. From just actively helping the victim, for example, and showing, no, this is not okay. I, this is important. <laughs> Look at this poor hurting person here, right? It can be a very, whether you're a, a Mother Teresa type or a, you know, a strong, like, you know. There's, there's different ways that you can respond to the situation. Yeah? Um, yeah, it, it just a thought occurred to me that I think a lot of bullies don't even realize what they're doing to the person, um, like long term, or what that person is experiencing after they turn and walk away from that. I think, uh, just from my experience of the people that I may have been a bully to in high school, like you know, just the, you know that I've known them now as adults and being able to rectify that, but just to realize that it did affect them more than I realized. And also, uh, just uh, an experience that I had with my son at the park, where I, I noticed a bigger kid, like older, um, and, you know, making fun of his speech or the way he was, you know, talking like a baby. And I went up to that kid and I said, how would you feel if a kid bigger than you said, you know, that did that to you? And the kid was just, you know, 
shocked and ran to his mother and I remember it just bothered me all day long and just saying that I'm, you know, I'm hoping that that kid then, you know, will think twice about that next time, you know. Isn't that a shame that you wouldn't be aware that this kind of behavior destroys people? That's why one of the exercises that I, is very commonly used, uh, my wife is a, an elementary school teacher and her mom is as well, so I know these little exercises, right? One of them is you take a piece of paper, and all the kids have a piece of paper, and they say, okay, now everyone scrunched up the piece of paper, okay. They say, okay, now open it up, and uh, it's all wrinkled up, and they say, now try to make it flat again. You can't. They say, that's what bullying does. Once you've done that damage, this person can't go back to the way they were before. This is a permanent damage that's occurring, and you need to understand the effect that your behavior has on others. And this is a phenomenon that is involved. With bullies, they don't, aren't always conscious, and there's often associated with bullies, a, a notable lack of empathy for the victim. They simply can't project themselves into the victim's shoes. Which is why this education, this awareness, is so important. And I'm thinking with that paper thing, how much paper do we need to waste before people get the picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about the pending government legislation and the, the attempt to define the terminology and prescribe the consequences that are going to have to be, you know, in the education system. Um, it, it, it appears that they're trying to focus on what it is and, and you know, even talk of making it hate crime. I mean, it, is all of this going just a little bit too far? Well, well I think a hate crime, my goodness. Uh, I think bullying can be used as a tool to perpetrate a hate crime if you wanted to. But I don't think bullying itself is a hate crime. Right? It's a behavior that's common to us all. Defining it, probably, I'm sure it has its use. Coming up with methodical uh, method, like methodical uh, response to these situations that can be implemented school by school, that has its use. But it's the individual, it's the person. They want to find out why would you do this on a human level? What is occurring in you? You can you can pathologize, you can label, you can define all you want. But it, that, I don't think that that will touch the heart of the problem, of the person. So everything has its place, but it has to be, there has to be the, the human factor. And that's, I don't know, individual, one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know what that is. Yeah. yeah, I also find myself really overwhelmed by, uh, you know, the where do you go from here sort of idea, you know, like I, listening to your talk, what I heard of it, I'm sorry, it was late. Um, you know, I, I was thinking that it would be so great to see that in, in high schools, junior high schools, you know, where kids are, are developing that sense of, of independence and, you know, learning that, you know, I do have a little bit of power and control in, you know, who I am, how I am, why I am, all of that. Um, and then I think, you know, but how do you, put that into an elementary school context where, um, you know, for, for many kids, I mean, they're, you know, who knows, maybe they're being, you know, bullied or something like it in their home, um, you know, and I think the schools don't necessarily, um, but this is just an outsider's opinion, the schools, I don't think, have a lot of power in how they respond to these things. Um, you know, it seems, on one hand, you could say, well, you know, bully gets punished and, you know, then we can coddle or take care of the victim. But, you know, as you're pointing out, everybody is a victim. Everybody is insecure. Everybody, I mean, and then, it, then this is where I get overwhelmed because it becomes this, you know, huge issue of, uh, as, a, as a society, we're all, like, unhealthy, mentally sick I was people. New generation. <laughs> Right, and, and what is what is wrong with us? We don't have this, you know. This, you know, where's the family that, that or the the you know the village that raises the child? It doesn't exist. We're not a community any anymore. You know, we don't know our neighbors. We don't say hello on the street. We we don't even blink when we witness something happening. To you know, you know, it, like it's it's across the board. So how do we fix that? You know what? What you just said there. One thing I didn't say in my talk was to the answer to the question, why is the problem getting worse, not better? To me, it's that, this disintegration yeah. right, that's occurring. And one of the interesting things that I read about uh, with regard to bullying is that the younger you are, the worse it is. But the, uh, the reports of bullying decrease with age. 
it's by a grade two is about the age where it's the highest. Which is it's shocking. <laughs> I mean, is that because as, as we get older and if we're exposed to enough information and, uh, and stuff, because we can intellectualize it? Well, they do say the younger kids tend to be targeted by the older kids, right? So the younger you are, the more likely you are to be a target. And I think that's where the, 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 the crude form of behavior is occurring and the early signs of, of behavior. I mean, I, I don't know, did you want to comment on... Hmm? No, sorry, my wife. <laughs> to uh, like what, what, what's occurring in the very younger ages where you start to see the signs of the behavior that will then... Well, I teach grade two, so that age, and I think maybe the kids are themselves trying to establish who they are, and not only trying to establish that to themselves, but to each other and to the rest of the class, trying to figure out their role in this hierarchy of the classroom. And one way of feeling at the top is by bullying and targeting other kids. So that's the perfect opportunity to stop it right there, where it's at the seed stage, where it's just beginning. And if you can Im implant a new way of dealing with what you're feeling and what you're experiencing, then that can be carried forward. But how do we do that across the board? How do we get the board. reach with that, right? That's where the challenge is, right? If we're all parents and we're all, you know, imparting that in our own children, uh, you know, yay. But yeah. then what about all the rest of the kids who aren't getting so there are, I mean, in, the, in terms of like actual recommendations for what to do in what circumstances, I mean, the, the factors that, that lead to bullying, they say are family factors to begin with, whether or not you see aggressive behavior modeled at home, that, that increases the risk of a person becoming a bully. Um, individual factors, if you're an aggressive and or impulsive person by nature, your, your natural tendency, you're more likely to be a bully. Um, and uh, if you're physically strong, you're more likely to be a bully. Uh, you're more likely to be a bully, uh, to be a victim of bullying if you're insecure in your physical capabilities, if you're naturally shy, quiet, or passive in nature, right? So this is, it's, it's who people are. And whether this person, is the same phenomenon, fear, but if you're an aggressive person, you become the bully. If you're a passive person, you become the victim, right? It's to be branching off of the same root of, of fear. And how do you deal with that? By, I don't know, by building, by nurturing each other, by being community, by participating, by not sitting around apath apathetically and maybe just posting something on Facebook and then feel like, there, I'm an activist. I, I did something today. <laughs> you know? I took part in this problem. Taking part is serious. It demands so much. And that's why it's so overwhelming. Oh, I can't even think about it. It's too much. If every person, it's like Sharon said, if everybody was happy, then nobody would be doing this. So almost like building up happiness, building up quality of life for people. And that can take, I don't know, I don't know what that takes. Can I add something to that? Just a couple little thoughts. One is about the legislation and such. Just, I've seen like um, in other areas of society where um, there has to have been like in, you know, women's rights and, um, and slavery and that kind of thing. The pendulum almost has to go far, too far to the extreme in order for it to come back and settle. And so the legislation might seem extreme, but it may not be necessary in future years as, uh, you know, that people just accept that you can't bully, it's not accepted in school, and so then the incidences are, are decreased, and it becomes more, there's less, you know, uh, punishment to be dealt out. But I think also, like, I just think about if Calvin could get into more school, and the kids and the bullies themselves hear his speech, they will leave there feeling really, you know, uh, like they can't now bully can't. because uh, everybody knows that you know, I'm going to, you know, I've got issues or whatever. So they're going to, you know, think twice. So if grade two is the is the age that this is coming out, then really it needs to be done not not only in high schools but in elementary well, as well. Yep. And I, would, I would add to that that just the fact that, that the audience here are adults, and how many parents, how many adults don't understand exactly what is bullying and what is what what makes up a bully a victim a bystander that by talking to parents of the school kids uh, right off the bat the entire parent population of schools and let them know so that they can watch their children and say "Ooh, my child seems to have a victim type tendency or a bully type tendency or I'm gonna and, and from there start having the parents helping their kids 
every single person has a role. Right? Uh, one of the things that I, uh, a nice little quote dealing with this whole question uh, from an ant a school-based anti-violence program from 1996, some important strategies in stopping bullying are providing good supervision for children, providing effective consequences to bullies, using good communication between teachers and parents, providing all children opportunities to develop good interpersonal skills, and creating a social context which is supportive and inclusive, in which aggressive bully behavior is not tolerated by the majority. That's, that's, that's it, right? So working towards that. Um, and they do say that the majority of bullying happens out of the eye of adults. Right? This is part of, the bullies aren't, the behavior is stupid, but bullies aren't stupid, right? higher risk of multiple criminal convictions. If this behavior isn't stopped, if it isn't taken seriously, this can destroy, it doesn't only destroy the victim, it destroys the bullies as well. Uh, to add on the victim's, I quite agree there, to add on to the victim's side of it, um, I think that it's a Source of, of the suffering that the bully was experiencing being removed 
and also being modeled how a person can be transformed. It's like children, bullies, can see, I don't need to be like this. I can change. Yeah? Um, when I think, I'm, or I wonder, I don't have any experience being a teacher or whatever, but I wonder if in the schools, I'm sure this is done to some extent, but as a prevention of bullying, if there was more emphasis on kindness and more singling out and um, honoring kindness, examples of kindness when it happens in the school, talking about it in the classroom, pointing out when children are kind to each other, maybe having a, a, a you know a, a kind student of the week award every week or, or every day or whatever. So that there's a lot of emphasis on the opposite of bullying, but being kind to each other. You know, act to to encourage and reward the good behavior rather than worrying <laughs> exclusively about how to stop the bad. Not that we wouldn't be Not standing up and doing do both. what we need to do when bullying is happening, but also um, working on the prevention and things. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that just, there's no reason not to. Of course, we want to raise people to be kind and loving and good. So well, why we wouldn't be doing it? If we don't recognize it, if we take it for granted and we don't kind of value it, you know, show that. I mean, children have to learn right. that kindness is really If we neglect that, that's where the corrosion happens. We think it's not important, we don't need to do that. And look what happens. I was just wanted to comment about what you had said over there about um, it, oh, like shining the light, like it, it, Calvin's speech here, and it, it, other students are hearing this, and, the, and it would, oh, okay, all right, this, we've just taken, we've just neutered the bullying in this <laughs> yeah. sense. <laughs> by uh, having that kind of talk and the, and the emperor is no closed now because everybody knows my secrets, you know, and I, okay, I'm not as effective anymore. So it's an interesting strategy just to get it out there. I understand. Yeah. I work at the high school, I'm a child and youth worker there, and we do do presentations in our grade nine classes. Um, I go in and we talk about bullying. I think one of the big issues is Students are, are so um, given so many mixed messages. They don't know what is bullying and what is just darn old rotten behavior. So again, once we empower them with the definition, the, the stumbling block does seem to be getting kids to come and talk to somebody, you know, to tell. Um, they still look at it as being, they're ratty, you know, this will go away if I just kind of ignore it. So again, that's one of the the things that we continually try to work on. And and like it can be like one of the one of the forms of bullying is social deliberate social exclusion. Mm -hmm. That can be absolutely invisible to anyone who's who doesn't know that it's happening. Right? So it's so important that the youth themselves, even adults, to be aware that this you it's you could be socially excluded as an adult, trust me. Right? And this can be done Intentionally, it can be done in, unintentionally as well. But where it's bullying is when it's being used as a weapon against somebody, right? And that can be something that, who knows, like, oh, what do I do? I go and tell my parents that they're not, and will the parents believe me? This is one of the reasons that people often won't report bullying, is they have this sense, and they're often reinforced, that if they tell somebody about it, an adult, the adult won't take it seriously. And this happens. We all like to think that we respond responsibly to these things. But we've all failed, I think, sometimes, from time to time. And it doesn't make a bad person out of you. We need to take things very seriously. And if somebody is reporting, even if it's technically not under the definition of bullying, if someone's just re reporting being hurt by something, or feeling damaged by something, we have to take this seriously. Quality of life for everybody is quality of life for me, for you. Um, part of the break the silence with the victim and when I, mean, I talk to my kids about it and they say well I did talk to somebody but they didn't do anything and 
So I say, well, then you go to another person. Yep. And if they don't do anything, you go to another person. And then another person. Until somebody acts. And there's telephone numbers you can give them, uh, etc. But recently at the parent-teacher meeting, I brought in a family. I had them, the mother and father come in and I said, congratulations, you are the parents of a bully. <laughs> and, and I'm smiling and laughing and saying, why do you say this? And I, I gave him the reasons and bullying being um, the difference between bullying and just darn right a nasty person is the repetitiveness of, um, of what they're doing. And in this case, it was a girl who was doing the social isolation. Uh, Thank you. Um, and telling the other kids, don't be around that person, ignore them, etc. Whatever. So I'm telling the father this, and the parents this, and the father's going, well, she's not hitting anybody, she's not a bully. And I'm going, well, no, no, bullying isn't just physical, it's mental, and, and in fact, mental, in my opinion, is worse because you don't see the, the actual uh, marks and, and the scars of what it's doing. And um, he, um, he, like other parents, were, um, came to the conclusion, oh, she's just being a girl, or he's just being a guy, to, and they'll outphase it. So that's... Uh, this is what I really like about what you're doing here, Cal, is that um, you're educating us. And if everybody could be educated like that, then that's going to be a big step towards <coughs> diminishing it, if not stopping it. And totally unintentionally, that parent participated in the bullying. Yep. It's like a victim of sexual abuse. They say, if you report it and the person doesn't take it seriously, that's another abuse. Yep. So that is a part of it. Yep. And speaking of that, that story that you told me or whatever about what exercise to use when it comes to uh, somebody who's been victimized by bullying, for example, or by whatever it happens to be, like sexual abuse or bullying or, or whatever, then you, you imagine, you, know, you do this exercise, you imagine a circle around yourself, and this is my safe space. And whatever words or insults or whatever it is that you throw at me, you take it, you visualize it, Write it down, scrumple it up, and throw it out of your circle. Sorry, that doesn't stay in here. And even just a practical exercise like that, you can throw the stuff in here, I'm going to throw it right back out. Practice some boundaries. Boundaries, yeah. And so, to deal with the victim and how the victim can respond, bully, and the parents, and the teachers, and friends. How often is a friend directly involved? just knowing or laughing or that's the, they say the bully isn't always the one doing it that's the bully but even if you're a friend supporting the bully that's bullying mm -hmm. okay, fine. They, they say that uh, right that if, if, if uh, teachers in a school context or whatever if the adult does not respond effectively then that sends the message to the other youth that this behavior is okay you'll get away with it it can be tolerated Right? So appropriate responses to this happening is a very, very important. And if it continues, you have to. Then, if it gets to that point, send the bully out of the class, of the school, whatever, not the victim. Right? So the other student that sends a strong message to other students. The consequences are for the one who is, is having this behavior. You're not going to remove the victim so that the victim is safe. Remove the bully so that the victim is safe. That appropriate responses. Yeah, so if bullies will not change their behavior despite concerted efforts by school personnel, they and not the victim should be the ones who are removed from the class or school. Consequences for the perpetrators will be of considerable interest to all students and will set the, sto the tone for future situations. And one of the things that I love talking about positive responses to these things is uh, two children's books that, that my wife brought home for me to read about it by uh, an author called Catherine Otashi. And one of them is called One, and the other one is called Zero. And I highly recommend them. They're beautiful works, and they're so positive, and they're bang on. So as an adult or a kid, whatever, read them. They're absolutely fantastic. And they paint the picture in the simplest terms, and the solutions in the simplest terms. Okay, as a survivor of bullying, I'm now 68 and you're just lucky I'm still here. Because if I would have known about suicide when I was 
the age of 8 to 12 years old, I would have done it. That's how bad it was. It was all types. It was physical, psychological, sexual, anything you want, I had it. Okay? But I don't know how I survived it. But I'm so grateful that today it's coming more forward and that there are resources that can deal with this type of thing. Um, it, because of what happened to me up to the age of 13, well, I was a tiny little person, so that's why I got picked on. And then I got hit. So I figured, hmm, I'm too small. So I'm going to put on weight and I'm going to be big. And they're not going to be able to do this to me anymore. Fine. That's what I did. And how did that work for me? <laughs> yeah, the bigger people that were, bu were the bullies, they got bigger too. And they just wanted to see how strong I was. So they took me on and I got the worst of it again. <laughs> like, th there was nothing back then. You tell your parents, but there was, yeah, okay, you, you know, don't be such a suck. Yeah. You know, suck put it up. up with it. Deal with suck it, it up. Deal, not even deal with it back then. That wasn't even a word. <laughs> it was just you're being a suck, like, you know, stand up for yourself. Like, I mean, how do you do that? You got one girl that's about, uh, what was she? I suppose she, she'd have been about 12 and I might have been 8. She had a gang of boys. And she was, the, she was the leader of this abuse, this physical abuse. And she'd get the boys to surround me so I couldn't get away from her, I couldn't run. And there's all kinds of things she would do. I'm, oh, the worst thing I can remember that happened to me, and I remember it yet, and if I can ever see this person, I'm gonna ask them why they did that. She spit on her hand and she hit me so hard across the face. When I was eight years old, I spun around about three times. I never forgot that yet. Never will forget that. But I've forgiven everybody. <laughs> I had to in order to live. Yeah. So that's my point. And I, Calvin, I promise and I pledge right here, if you can use me any way to help stop this bullying, I'm there. All right. I'm going to be a All participant. Right. I'm not going to go on Facebook. <laughs> and it's funny also because I was bullied, my daughter was bullied. But I had to bully the bully to get him to stop. I called his parents and I, told, I, I was talking to the mother at noon one day. I said, this can't go on anymore. I said, this is terrible. I mean, he's catching her every day coming home from school and he was hitting her. I mean, it, that was bad enough psychologically, but he was hitting her. And I said, you know, he, he, he can't do that. Well, it's her fault. Whatever she's doing to him makes him hit her. I said, no, that's not what it is. I said, there's no, no reason for it. I watch it. She walks on the other side of the street, and he's going home on that side, and he'll run across and he'll hit her. Because I saw it. She said, well, it's, it's got to be her fault. And we know he has a bad temper, and, and we don't aggravate him. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. And I hung up the phone. And that day I watched. And I saw what he did. And I got in the car and I run down. I put my daughter in the car. I said, show me where he lives. And I went. And I had to drive around. And he wasn't, of course, outside. But eventually he did come out of the house. I stopped the car right in the middle of the street. I left the car door open. And I went over to him. And I didn't touch him because I knew I'd go to jail. <laughs> What I said to him mm, can't be repeated anywhere. <laughs> but I, in no uncertain terms, told him if he ever laid a hand on her again, he would never walk. <laughs> and uh, I said, and don't make me come back the second time. So I got in the car and I went home. He never touched her again. He didn't have very much good to say about me, but <laughs> at least he never hit her again. And we could deal with the psychological stuff, I mean, what he was doing. Uh, I could counsel her and, and, and ha help her to deal with that. But other than that, I think he did, he'd still, I'd like to know what he's doing today. <laughs> well, I bet that was a wake-up call. Like, yeah. uh, often people just don't stand up to bullies. Yeah. It, there's this, this, it, I mean, so that probably shocked him. Well, <laughs> somewhat. Know. At least he didn't You're hit right. her anymore, yeah. but I mean, you and know. He's, he's and then the experience, I don't have power. Somebody yeah. has taken it away from yep. me. Right? And then my son got the same thing. So, like, did I have, like, go ahead, bully me and bully my kids too, written on my forehead or what? It just...
keeps going and makes sure yep. it's... Yep, almost it's, like the cycle of abuse and uh, right. in violence in, uh, right. in life. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting thing. that in your experience, the female being the ringleader of this group of boys. Yeah, this well, is what I'm... <laughs> it's very interesting. One of the, one of the things about bullying that um, the majority of... The, well, you'll see where I'm going with this. The majority of bullies are boys. The majority of victims of bullying are boys. This is statistically true. That doesn't mean girls aren't bullies, and I'll tell you, when a girl bullies, it can be. But in my talk, I compared the bully to an alpha hyena. Mm. And after I'd written that, I thought I should really look up an alpha hyena to find out if that has any, if it even exists, this term, an alpha hyena. I just pictured this laughing, you know, um, strong, dominant. And the alpha hyena is a female. Always. And the alpha hyena has high levels of testosterone. And I won't tell you, what, Google it, there's really interesting characteristics that are associated with all of that. Uh, very interesting. But it, this, this, this aggressive, dominant behavior in humans and in animals comes with the ones that are the aggressive and the higher testosterone and things like that. So there's a biological basis for a lot of this behavior. And if a female becomes a dominant female, very often, not just within the animal world, but also in the human world, this can be even more uh, violently dominant than even a male may, may be. Right? Yeah. How do people get away with this? If somebody came up to me and punched me, I'd be like, oh my goodness, how could I I'd I'd go, I tell everyone, this, do you see what the, the, uh, can you believe that this person punched me? That this, you, you can't do that. You can't do that. I was, I never for a moment would have thought that this can be done or tolerated or, or I would have been appalled. So the idea that there are people being punched, beaten, physically, sexually, psychologically abused, and the sense of, oh, but I can't tell anybody. What a shame, what a horrible omission in, a, in our society, in our families, person to person, that people would think that this isn't something to be appalled by, to report, to tell, like, I, I can't believe you would do this. Or if somebody's doing it to somebody else, I can't believe you're doing that. And why and how? This goes to show that things don't change from 60 years ago, eh? No, they don't. <laughs> it's and still every new That's why it has to, it has to be... It has to be wiped out. It's like a virus. If you don't get rid of the whole thing, if you don't have a bacterial infection, if you don't get rid of all of it, it'll come back. It'll come back. The roots of oppression, they have to be dug out entirely. The idea that anyone is inferior, the idea that anyone is superior for whatever reason, okay, so your muscles are bigger. Oh, well, so what? I mean, so what? Everyone's different in all kinds of different ways. The idea that anything would be associated with making anyone better than anyone else, or that anyone would get away with that kind of thing, is disgusting. And it happens all the time. Well, I know bullying certainly changed the outcome, I believe, changed the outcome of where I'm at today because I'm not the person, I don't think I'm the person I'm supposed to be because of the that way it happened and permanent. what they did. And it is victims of bullying even if they get their life on track, even if they mm -hmm. report recovery of all these things, almost always associated with a lifelong lower self-esteem. Damage is permanent. Some of the damage can be permanent. Once is, for 50 years. And Not there now. was a, on the CBC recently, uh, they did a whole thing about bullying. I didn't get to hear it. Yeah. I haven't been able to find it online yet, but I, I think it's there. Where they had, my sister was telling me about it, where they had um, bullies call in, right? To talk about it. The bullies' lives have been permanently affected by this, for the worst. Bullies years after they had done the bullying. Years after, this is after, as they grow up, and the memories of having done it, the damage it's caused to them to be aware of, the damage that they've caused to other people, and so they're all sharing this. Their lives have been damaged by having been bullies, and then of course the victims have had a chance to call in too, victims of bullying as adults, and talk about, you know, do you forgive? And some of them, so violently, no, I will never forget. 
damage was so severe, I can't. And that is so tragic to me, the idea that somebody can be damaged so excessively that forgiveness is not possible. That's damage. You can't get rid of it. If you can't forgive a person, you're damaged. Right? And sometimes that's how severe it is. The bully's lives permanently affected, the victim's lives permanently affected, and of course the bystander. How does that affect you long term, to see things like that happen and know that you just stood by and watched? People experience guilt for that. I think there are people even who called in saying that. I still today regret that I just stood by and watched that. This is such a serious problem. But the CBC radio, I mean, people, every, we're, everyone's fighting it, right? People are fighting this, right? And I think that we're, like we were just talking uh, with the LGBT Latter County here, and with, when it comes to lesbian, gay, bi, trans youth who experience disproportionately high rates of bullying compared to the general population, very high, that there's, there's a momentum happening. Yes. And it's going to be, I think, sooner rather than later, it'll be something that we'll look back and think, how on earth did this happen? It's being eradicated. The, the, the antibiotics are being injected into our youth, into our adults, into everything. By just bringing it to the forefront of our attention. Yeah. Same as this bullying, yeah. it's now everybody's talking. And if about there's it. a parent who comes and says, no, that's not bullying, oh, mm -hmm. it, you, you don't tolerate that. You don't let somebody get away with, with uh, what is that? That's um, it's a term. Denial? What? Denial? Uh, <laughs> accessory? Accessory. It's something along those lines. Um, An accomplice? Accomplice. Maybe. Rationalization. Rationalization? Yeah, that doesn't, oh, yeah, we're right. It's just the way we, we, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't provoke him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Stop. Come down. laughs> right. And so there's a failure on the part of, of everyone involved, including often especially the parents. And especially also if the parents are modeling. They say bullies learn this behavior. They learn to deal with situations aggressively. And there is one report I was reading, they say that it's a myth that bullies suffer a lower self-esteem. That the studies indicate that bullies have actually an, either an average or a higher than average self-esteem. And I think, boom, yeah. they really sat down with that person. To treat somebody like that, you're not okay. Somebody who's okay is a loving, happy person. It's the damage that is occurring, or not knowing how to model, to, to have, they say, it's an aggressive behavior modeled at home. It's not low self-esteem, aggressive behavior modeled at home. The aggressive behavior modeled at home, that would affect my self-esteem. <laughs> if all it is I'm seeing, this is how my parents interact, that, rather than being raised as I was by parents who genuinely love each other and support each other. That was my model. So I was actually, I grew up with a unmeddled with sense of self-worth. Somebody who has the opposite being modeled does not have a healthy and unmeddled with sense of self-worth. They just don't. This is a, it's, it's a malfunction that's occurring. Somebody who's well and healthy is good and loving. Call me crazy. Yeah. One of my kids was assaulted off the school property when they were in grade five. And I ended up taking it to the police. And after all the information was in and so on, the constable asked me, why did I come to them? Because this constitutes assault. Yeah. She said, you would be surprised the number of parents just call it kids being kids. Mm -hmm. and, and this was literally one girl holding her down and the other punching her. And it turned out they just decided whoever came along next they would beat up. So um, now one of them was a teenager, so she was charged. But um, we have to assume. Another angle I find too is you think, oh, well, your child is just being sad about something, you know, and, and you don't delve into the reasons why your child stays in her room, why he 
your your child doesn't want to have friends, etc. So it, it, it's very important as a parent to even in our busy work life um, is to try to delve into reasons behind that and play the nosy parent. Um, yes, you will definitely get from your children, oh mom or oh dad, but that's the role. And if it saves your children in the long run, try to pay close attention to the signs. If you have an inkling there's something not quite right, delve into it with the teachers, with the principals, with other parents of, of what friends she has, and so on. Um, try not to be, oh, well, it's just normal for a child. Because obviously, if it's enough to make you have a anything, then there's something there to delve into. Absolutely. And that is a form of butting in. Butt in. Do whatever it takes. Take the risk of, of, of trying too much rather than the risk of not trying enough. Always err on the side of caring, of concern, of, of interest. And then the supervision is directly related. Parents who don't aren't involved with their kids enough, teachers who don't supervise or, or aren't paying close enough attention, these are direct factors in bullying. Um, uh, and very quickly before I forget, sorry, very quickly before I forget it, one of the really interesting, like when, when it comes to tattling and kids who think that they can't tell, because it's you're, you're told not to tattle, don't tattle. And I'm thinking, well, tattle, compared to this tattle, I don't. But there is also, as my wife has said, uh, which she tells her students is, there's a difference between tattling to get someone into trouble and tattling to get someone out of trouble. If you're reporting something to help someone, or reporting something to hurt someone, you can, even a little kid can understand the difference between those that use their own judgment. Yeah. There was an article in the Toronto Sun, I think, It's a new schoolyard, so. That is so important. Adults today may not realize how the world has changed. Social media is everything. And you can think, oh, I, I'm there, I, I see my kid, I see what they do, whatever. You may not see what's going on on the computer, right? This is a new world. Like, the majority of a young person's life now is online. And a lot of adults don't get the Twitter, the Facebook, all of those things like that. 
And how do we respond to it? It's just emerged so quickly and so powerfully that even the teacher, the teachers, uh, the College of Teachers is still trying to figure out how do I respond to this new reality? Do we friend or not friend our students? This question has never been asked before because it's never been relevant before. And the fact that bullying is occurring on a massive scale online is a whole new form of bullying that we've never seen before or had to deal with before. Before it was, it was a person being beat up or teased or whatever. And now, and it can be online, how devastating it is to have your life destroyed online, permanently out there. Videos posted of people that they take and put things permanently out there. It's disgusting, it's, it's shocking, it's horrifying. And maybe, if te that's maybe a form of supervision, isn't it? If teachers were actually involved on, their, on the Facebook lives of the students and things like that. Because how else can teachers and parents supervise that part, that massive part of a young person's life? It's, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. I'm still avoiding Facebook like the plague. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's so important. How do, you, how do you take that piece of the puzzle and work it into a, a solution? Because it's huge. That can't be overlooked. I have a girlfriend who uh, has a 13-year-old daughter, or was 13 at the time, and she didn't know how to uh, even handle her own daughter. She's a single mom. And her daughter was even bullying her to the point where she didn't know how to, she couldn't approach her teenager. But um, I guess there was this online bullying going on. Her daughter was doing it to another student in the school. And what the, what, uh, I don't know who made the decision, but what they decided to do was actually to arrest her uh, charge it as a crime, like the, the hate crime sort of thing. She went to jail for one day, or, or was taken to jail by a police officer, and when she went to pick up her daughter, totally different person. She said, it's unbelievable. It's like the biggest miracle that could have happened to her, <laughs> to her life. So, you know, it was this horrifying thing to think that her daughter was taken away, uh, you know, by a police officer and charged with this crime and whatnot, but what, what a difference it made. And that's why child's future. I firmly believe that how whatever front a bully puts out, that's not who they are. There is a good person in there. It can and it can come out like that. Right? This is not someone to give up on. This is not someone to think this is a uh, one of the, the, our, just this embarrassment in our, our society that we have these horrible versions of people. These are good people. And there's a good person inside of that. And so when somebody's doing it, why? What is going on inside of you? And what will it take to get the good one out? And it'll make all the difference in your life and everyone else's. And it's for the better. We just want quality of life for you and everyone else here. What, is it, what will it take? Will it take a night in jail? Because we can arrange that. <laughs> and like, sometimes, I, you know, some, I know a kid who, who was bully throwing rocks at a little tra a trans girl, in Manitoba, having rocks thrown at her. And this is, that could kill a person. Like, how is this not being treated as criminal behavior? This is physical abuse, it can lead to death and injury. And why is this not being taken seriously? Why would she not think that she could report something like that? What's going on? I, I wonder sometimes if. You know, using the word bully is part of the problem, right? It, you know, if you give something a, a cute name or a name that is associated with other things, I mean, why don't, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. You know, does it make sense to talk about bullying as this, you know, pervasive thing that, you know, that we have to fight or, you know, or does it make sense to say, like, like can't, you know, why can't we, we teach people or, you know, children that, that they deserve to be treated nicely and people around them deserve to be treated nicely. You know, like why aren't we addressing the behavior rather than the label thing? Yeah. And, and talking you know, about definitions, is this the right one? And this, does this apply yeah. to everyone? And does it fall into this category? Because otherwise we're not going to take it so seriously. Yeah. What is violence? What is an act of violence? There could be, I, I read a story uh, one time by Mel White, who's a, he's a an American uh, you got a writer, author, and he told a story. He knew Martin Luther King Jr., and they were driving at night, 
and Martin Luther King Jr. was driving, and a car was coming in and flashed the lights at you, the, the high beams, like your high beams are on, flashing lights or something, but the high beams weren't on. So Mel White says, oh, well, flash your beams back. He's flashing at you, your high beams aren't on, so flash back. Uh, that jerk. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, that would be an act of violence. And he was taken aback by that. How can that be an act of violence? So we have to understand what does it mean? An act of violence, an act out of anger, an act out of punishing somebody else, for example. It can be the tiniest thing, and these are the seeds that grow into the rest. And unless we understand what true goodness is, loving actions, as opposed to violent actions, if we don't understand that, <coughs> how can we solve the problem? To like to get to uh, the fence, and they said, "Okay, now with every yeah, it was you, it was you." I love them. Where they got the kids to, or for every uh, a mean act, to go and, and, a, and a nail gets hammered into the fence. Okay, another mean act, you never have a nail until like the fence is filled with nails for all these mean acts, and then for every good act, go and take a nail out. Another good act, and after you get all the good acts that make up for all the mean acts, you say, "Well, to the kids." Then, then what, what does the fence look like? You say, well, like, the fence is full of holes. Even if all the nails are taken out, the fence is full of holes. It's been damaged. You can make up for mean acts, but you can't erase that damage. Huh. Kids can see that. They can understand that. Oh, I'm so sorry for people whose lives have been damaged by this kind. It's devastating. It's horrible. It's horrifying. Yeah, on a positive, there was a conversation the other day with some friends about how to get people in the church and so on, thinking of all these you know, programs you can do and so on. But it came down to basically you have to go out and invite somebody. You have to go with people one on one, not just the minister and so on. But, but, and then, what you were saying, as we all have a bit of everything. How change happens. That, that whole thing of Gandhi. How did he control a control? He had the ability to move millions at a time in a country where there was no media. It was word of mouth from one tiny remote Indian village to the next tiny remote Indian, Indian village because that was the power of his message. He had truth and love and goodness on his side and that spreads like a virus, and it's one to one to one because it means something in a person's life and it transforms a person. You can send it out, you can broadcast, you can have all the Facebook pages in the world, you can have a fancy poster and color and everything like that. But it's got the message itself has to be powerful enough to move itself from person to person to person. Otherwise, it's just show, it's just flesh, it's just the change has to happen one by one by one by one, and then it's permanent change. We're talking about when it comes to people being uh, affirming of lesbian, gay, bi, trans people, and people who are, the, the idea that there's so many people 
who move from thinking that there's something wrong with it to, to being affirming and thinking it. But you all, never, almost never or never see anyone make the opposite move. From being affirming to then being not. Right? Once that transformation has occurred in a person, you don't go back. And that speaks volumes. Because there's truth to it. As opposed to just a belief, an idea, a concept that you can adopt or reject. Truth changes people. And that's permanent. <laughs> oh, this is good. I'm so glad. I mean, it's, this is why I'd rather have 20 people who care here. Yeah. This is good. This is what, this is what matters. Well, thank you all for being here. I had fun. I hope you did too. And um, I'm not an expert on both. I'm, I'm not. I spoke only when my talk was just what I've observed in my life. And then I did the research afterwards. <laughs> and, okay, yeah, it does actually kind of at least fit the research. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's the video will go on the website, and I'll try to post also some information that could be of use. All right. At least you're doing something. Yeah, do, yeah whatever. Do something. Even the dumbest idea is enough to and then it grows. Whatever it takes to do it. Yep. Whatever you can do, do it.